right, well, I could go through a long list of accomplishments of our speaker this month. In fact, I will go through part of that impressive list. But uh, before I do, I just wanted to express the appreciation of all of us at the Foundation for the encouragement and advice and support that Dave has given us over the past, what, year and a half or so at least. And uh, we've, we've been able to draw on some of his experiences and, and the wisdom that comes from that. And uh, it's helped our Heritage Builders program grow as it has this past year and a half or so. It's just been a great encouragement to us. I'm really looking forward to hearing our guest and a warm welcome to Dave McCandry. Thanks so much, Don. It's a, a great pleasure and honor to be here today. This has uh, gotten to be the uh, premier uh, lecture series in the uh, broader community, and it's uh, nice to be on the roster. Don and I talked about doing that. I think we scheduled this last January, almost uh, a year ago, and here we are. <clears throat> uh, it's also good to see so many familiar faces and friends. I appreciate those folks who are my friends and acquaintances that have turned out, that's always encouraging. It's always nice to know there's a friendly face or two out there <clears throat> to help bridge over the inevitable stumble, or if there is a stumble, I, there's, a, there's a kindly eye out there. Uh, my presentation, just to introduce it, it's actually in two parts. Uh, the first part's a slideshow drawn from many of the images that are in the exhibit, wh whose name changed since this PowerPoint was made. Arctic Ambitions, Captain Cook, and the Northwest Passage from the uh, collection of the Washington State Historical Society. The second half of my talk in the 50 minutes or so we have together, uh, together today is an attempt to try to give you some feel for the character of James Cook and where he fits in a broader cultural pattern than just the cartographic world, which is the emphasis of the first part of the talk and is perhaps, because it's visual in nature, maybe more easily accessible. Uh, and besides which, there are some great images here that are pretty rare, rarely seen, and uh, worth, uh, worth dwelling on. So uh, that's, uh, that's our agenda for today. So uh, let's get started. I gotta get uh, comfortable with the technology. I wanna make sure, yes, my laser button works and we'll go to our first slide. The evolution of the Northwest Passage as a cartographic image. Of course this is part and parcel of a larger cultural phenomenon which was the attempt of the European powers over the course of the Renaissance and the Enlightenment era uh, running through really to the um, uh, all the way into the late uh, uh, in the middle of the, eight, of the 19th century uh, but which reached a crescendo of activity in the 18th century in the person of Captain James Cook. But to put his accomplishments in some kind of cartographic context, I think it's helpful to take a look at how people presumed the surface of the world was configured prior to his time. This is actually the oldest uh, a map that's in the collection of my former institution, the Washington State Historical Society published in 1626. Now there are several features of this map that are worth paying attention to, and I have about 13 slides just so you know how far we're going in our progression. First, I call your attention not to the geographic content, although I will come back to that, but look at the decorative element all the way around the border, and these little icons, sea serpents, uh, exotic nautical creatures, uh, populating the, the seascape. Uh, and then, of course, there is the geographic content itself. This is, um, as you must have inferred, is an early projection of what the Western Hemisphere looked like uh, 120 some years after Columbus and uh, uh, um, that earliest generation of European explorer began kind of founding around in the waters here uh, of, uh, of the Western Hemisphere. Columbus, of course, uh, c concentrating uh, in um, the uh, Caribbean, <clears throat> but with various uh, Spanish, French, and British explorers, uh, the, the, the construct of the Western Hemisphere was slowly coming into view. Now, you'll see a couple quite quaint things. For example, California is an island, <clears throat> which if there's a big earthquake may happen again, <laughs> but, uh, but there it is. <clears throat> 
uh, and you can see off any, anywhere inland off of the coast of the Atlantic or the Gulf of Mexico is very hazily conceived or some intimation of Hudson Bay and Baffin Bay, Greenland up here. But for the moment, I'm going to dwell on the southern hemisphere because that's where Captain Cook becomes a formidable figure in the history of cartographic projection of the world as a whole and in particular uh, the Northwest Passage. For example, look down here, you'll see the terminology, the unknown world. Uh, in Latin, this was more commonly known in this era as terra australis incognita. And this concept is perhaps better conveyed in this next slide, which is a total a projection of the entire globe surface, now both the, the, old, the old world as well as the new. Uh, several things again, uh, uh, and I'll come back to terra australis. But you can now see that this massive bulbous extension of North America, perhaps projecting so far to the west that it actually became a part of the Eurasian landmass way over here in the, uh, the eastern extent of Siberia. The date of, is 1651 again. A <clears throat> little, little more definition, California is still an island. You can, this is uh, obviously a projection of what we would know as South America, and you can see the way <coughs> Africa and the continents of the old, <coughs> so-called old, old world were mapped out. But I come back to my main point, which is this hint of a coastline of the great southern continent. You can see it in this half of the world, <coughs> and you can see it over here at the southern extremity of the Indian Ocean over uh, on the other side uh, of the globe. <clears throat> the Great Southern Continent was one of the two or three great legendary fixtures of the uh, European imagination of this era, 16th, 17th, 18th century. The premise of it actually went back to the ancient Greeks uh, in the sense that <clears throat> back in Ptolemy and uh, those folks, excuse me, Uh, the premise uh, in, in geographic theory was that there had to be a large mass of land south of the equator because there was obviously such a huge mass of it north of the equator, a corresponding amount of the element had to be south of it, otherwise <clears throat> the world would wobble out of control <laughs> which from our kind of normative appreciation of, our, of what our senses tell us, that the earth doesn't seem to wobble, therefore it's in balance. The, the fancy term for this was uh, uh, equipoise. Things was, it was equal uh, or, or counterpoise, the, 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 the hemisphere, now southern hemisphere, northern hemisphere were balanced. And so therefore, there was this great uh, mystery, this uh, unknown southern continent that had not yet been found by people uh, of, 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 of European birth. Uh, nor had anyone really been sent to look for it till Cook, and I'll come back to that, but I want to go to uh, a, a few more slides to turn now to um, uh, the northern hemisphere again. Now this is a much later map, 1754, which coincidentally is the year James Cook uh, left the coal trade in Great Britain and, became, and enlisted in the Royal Navy as an able seaman. Uh, and through the course of his career, of course, all, was promoted all the way to captain, and had he lived, would have inevitably become an admiral uh, at, at one point. The important point here uh, is to, and the next slide <coughs> will give this uh, additional dimension, is that there, are, there were, uh, as the 18th century proceeded, uh, there, there came to be uh, several, what I would call national schools of geographic thought, in particular as relates to the Northwest Passage. Now this is a Dutch map, and you can see in contrast to some of the earlier images, the key concept here is that the Northwest Coast of, this is just, it's, 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 its own form of terra incognita, really a blank space west of Hudson Bay, and you can see that the coast of North America, the Northwest Coast of North America was envisioned as bending ever so slightly towards Hudson Bay and the waters of the North Atlantic. And this was 
uh, the, the central concept of the dynamic of the Northwest Passage. Because one of the ironies, almost profound actually, given the history of, of the Western Hemisphere, is that virtually from its discovery from a European vantage point, the European nations and then later when the United States spun off from European influences and became its own nation, that there, there, there was associate, there was a high degree of interest in finding a shortcut through the continent of North America, which had its own attributes, which of course we can all attest to personally, but there was this desire to find a way through and across the continent in some fashion, uh, which indeed, as we all know from our grade school education, was the original impulse that sent Columbus out in the Atlantic Ocean in the first place to find a route from uh, Europe, the West, Western Europe to Asia, without having to go that long route that through uh, uh, across the bottom of, of, uh, of Africa, through the Indian Ocean, and then over to the East Indies. As we all know, that was, that was what Columbus was sent to find. He found something obviously much bigger, as did a succession of explorers uh, over the course of the ensuing century or two. But the dream of a shortcut or a passage from the North Atlantic to Asia never died. And in fact, I would argue, and, this, and I deal, this is one of the major themes of my book, it hasn't died yet. And I'll, I'll come back to that point uh, near the end of my talk. So the key concept here with this slide, <clears throat> national schools of geographic thought, which you can also see here in this French map just a few years later, completely different projection. Based, of, of course, upon a, a key point, which I, I think I realize now I've skipped over, which is that no one had explored the northwest coast of North America, and so that made it ripe for speculation and imaginary projections. The favorite French idea being the concept depicted here, something the geographer in this case termed the Mer de la West, the wet Great Western Sea. The concept here is actually kind of, uh, it's a parallel extension from the principle of, of equipoise and counterpoise that I talked about earlier regarding the land mass in the northern hemisphere needing a correspondingly sized land mass in the southern hemisphere. This principle played out across a host of geographic phenomena. And in this case, the premise was is that since there was a great interior inlet off of the Atlantic Ocean, like from my angle, I'm, I'm struggling to see it, but Hudson Bay is depicted somewhere in this vicinity in Baffin Bay. The thought was, again, drawing on the principle of equipoise, there had to be a corresponding deep, wide inland sea off the Pacific Ocean that extended well into the continent of North America. As I, again, this was a favorite idea of French cartography through the, the entire run of the 18th century. Um, that, that's a whole talk in itself. I'll have, to, I'll have to move beyond it. But I just wanted to demonstrate how no one having explored the northwest coast of North America made it ripe for the imposition of a vast range of very fanciful ideas about what this part of the world, our part of the world, might actually look like if somebody went there to explore it. But there was another aspect to it, and this was kind of the, the beguiling nature of this fanciful geography, because there's a consistent, although the, the Dutch projection and this French projection are vastly different, they share one thing in common. They suggest that there just might, because of the, this inland sea or the northeasterly tilt of the continent, it would be easy to find a northwest passage from the Pacific side to the Atlantic because the continent either bends that way or there's a great inland sea that would allow you to connect to Hudson Bay. And it's this kind of beguiling idea, of, well, we just got to send somebody out there. It's, it's, it's just there for the taking. We just have to send somebody there to look for it, which, of course, is where Cook will come into play in due course during the balance of this talk. <clears throat> and then one more, 1761. Uh, by this time, uh, uh, James Cook uh, has already participated in the uh, British conquest of uh, Quebec. Um, he had mapped 
uh, the island of Newfoundland over the, uh, starting in 1761 uh, over, over several summers, also may up, mapped the St. Lawrence River. Here's Hudson Bay that I was referring to earlier. Now this, this map is perhaps a little more responsible in the way we think of it today, where, uh, and, and this begins to anticipate Cook's approach to cartography, which is if you don't know what's there, you just simply leave the space blank. And although California is no longer an island, you'll see, but there's some hint of various inlands, uh, inlets and, uh, and aspects of the northwest coast. In this case, you'll see the key point being the, the, the emerging sense <clears throat> in the wake of Vitus Bering's voyages from Russia, having come across the Northeast Pacific from Kamchatka, uh, that uh, the northwest coast of North America doesn't bend to the northeast, there's, uh, but in fact extends to the northwest, and this is in, in fact something James Cook would, would verify. Now this is uh, uh, an engraving of the great navigator, as he, as he is commonly known. <clears throat> uh, the original of this painting, uh, from which this engraving is, is taken, is actually at the History Museum exhibit in Tacoma, prepared by uh, John Weber, who was the principal artist on Cook's third and last um, uh, voyage. And here's where I'll, uh, th this slide will be up here quite a bit, and for, for anyone who later wants to take a look at it, I've provided a colorized version of it that's uh, kind of in ta more tangible form down here. And so for the next few minutes, I'd actually like to put, uh, sum up Cook's uh, exploits and how it relates to the Northwest Passage. So this map was included in the atlas of the third, uh, uh, in the atlas of the uh, British Admiralty's account of Cook's third and last voyage, although it included his track from all three voyages. Uh, this is a, a, a composite map then in that sense. And I argue in the anthology to this exhibit, uh, you can get this book at Amazon.com. If any one of you buys it, I'll go up a couple hundred thousand on the bestseller list. <laughs> I argue in, the, in that anthology that this is the first modern map of the world in the sense that although one might see some anomalies from our uh, normative understanding of the world's geography, for example, the southeastern corner of Australia doesn't qu look quite like that, we would look at that map and say, yeah, there's Africa, North, uh, North America is spaced about right from, uh, from Asia, the, a lot of the island chains in the Pacific are out there. Uh, and um, um, this was, um, this was uh, a, a landmark in cartographic history because uh, of several reasons, one of which is that in fact it is the first map that, that resembles our, our, our contemporary understanding of the world's geography. It's interesting in several other respects, just getting a little more granular. You notice, for example, that Great Britain's not at the center of the projection. If I had more maps, and this is the short version of this talk, you'll see that Great Britain's actually off on the periphery of this rather than the center. It's actually the Pacific Basin that's at the center of the image, which is unusual, They're not unique, not the first one of its kind, but it's interesting that the, the Pacific's in the center of the projection. Um, but it's singular quality, they really, just to perhaps state the obvious from some of the projections that preceded it, is you'll see that it is strictly adherent <clears throat> to the scientific ethos of uh, latitude and longitude grid lines. This being the equator uh, and what would later be established as the prime meridian over here. Um, and none of that decorative element that you saw in some of those earlier maps. This is a pristine geographic uh, view of the world without, uh, again, all the, 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 the mysterious gobbledygook or fanciful projections of the world's surface as you saw on some of the earlier maps. Now again, there are mistakes. There's no hint of Vancouver Island, for example. I'll come back to that. And I already pointed out that this part of Australia is skewed a little bit. The shape of Korea and Japan are not quite uh, accurately delineated as, as, we would, uh, as we would perceive them today. In fact, 
that's one of the misfortunes of Cook having gotten killed on the third voyage because it was his intention on the way back from sur uh, 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 assessing the prospects for a Northwest Passage through Bering Strait, <clears throat> it was his intention to do a survey of the east coast of Asia. And th uh, those who survived him also attempted to do that, but they were blown off course by a typhoon. So that's the importance of the map, but I, now I'd like to shift its usage to kind of a, a storytelling device. This map was published in 1784. Thank you. I appreciate your um, asking that clarifying question. So Cook took three voyages. They commenced respectively in 17, 1768, 1772, and 1776. And he died near the end. Uh, of the third one. On the first voyage, having established his reputation as a surveyor and, uh, and nautical skills more generally here in, the, in what we would know today as Atlantic Canada, he was promoted to be a lieutenant and was commissioned with the responsibility of leading astronomers to Tahiti out here in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, <coughs> which had been discovered uh, the previous half decade by another British navigator. The reason Cook was sent to, the reason Tahiti was, a, uh, was picked, um, um, the, the larger context is, uh, is that in 1769, as had been predicted early in the previous century by the famous astronomer Edmund Halley, it was determined that the, tr that the planet Venus would transit across the face of the sun. And that by virtue of, of the, uh, determining the location, uh, uh, taking a view of that transit and timing it, at disparate parts upon the world's surface, you would thereby be able to calculate, and I can't come near to being able to do this in practical terms, so you're just going to have to take me on faith on this. The essence of the experiment was is that if you viewed the transit across the sun's face, from different spots on the world, world surface and timed the event, you would be able to establish the distance of the sun, uh, of the, the distance of the Earth from the sun, or for that matter, Venus from the sun. We all know that distance, of course, to be 93 million miles. <clears throat> that number came into cognizance, was refined over time as a result of this experiment. So the astronomers in 1769 were sent all over the world's surface to set up their observatories. And on the predicted day when Venus would track across the uh, sun's face, people would, would, uh, would, uh, would be able to fix their location rigorously, latitude and longitude, using these lines. And they'd be able to time it if they were there on a clear day. And th these results could be collated, and the astronomical unit could be calculated. That's how Cook first got into the Pacific. At the end of that experiment, which was not entirely successful for reasons we don't have time to get into today, Cook had subsidiary orders to try to get a handle initially on this idea of the lost or unknown southern continent. And so when he finished the experiment at Tahiti in June of 1769, he headed into the higher latitudes of the southwest Pacific, during which time he was able to establish the, uh, the insular nature of New Zealand, which prior to that time was thought to be a northern promontory of a larger continent that, list, that uh, existed in these latitudes, as you saw conceptually in some of those earlier maps. After which he also surveyed the eastern coast of Australia, the west and northwest coasts having been previously uh, uh, visited by Dutch sailors, thus New Holland as the nomenclature. Of course, we all know this today as Australia. Cook uh, came back to Great Britain to great acclaim, as well as the naturalists that were with him, collecting many plants. And the, the kangaroo was first sighted and described on that trip, for example. And as a result of the success of that voyage, Cook was commissioned for a second, more encompassing, comprehensive survey of the Southern Hemisphere to answer once and for all whether there was a great southern continent. This time he came um, uh, down south of Africa. And you, and you can see some sense of it, perhaps better on my uh, tangible chart down here. But if you look closely, you can see Cook's track here. 
uh, it keeps probing along the, uh, the Antarctic ice edge here. I have an inset, I'll show this in more detail. And although this is a, 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 a linear projection over the course of three summers, three southern summers, which would be the winter time here, Cook is able to determine there is no continent in these latitudes. He did get the sense because of the volume of ice that he would routinely encounter once he got above 70 degrees south latitude, that there probably was land near or at the South Pole. He had what would be called intimations of such thing, but probably never actually saw what we would today know as Antarctica. This is generally con considered to be Cook's um, greatest voyage because of its length, duration, the conclusive nature of solving the mystery of the great southern continent, and he returned and retired uh, in 1775, only to be cajoled or perhaps volunteer to serve on one last mission, which was to investigate the other great geographic mystery of the late Enlightenment, which was the idea of the Northwest Passage. And so now Cook literally sails into that cartographic world, the predecessor images of which I shared heretofore in this talk. So he's going to sail into those waters to try to answer that question. And does so again by sailing south through Cape Town, across the southern Indian Ocean. This, there's his track. Uh, re refreshes his, his crew, gets some wood and water here. Um, visits Tonga, Tahiti, and then sails north in the late, uh, early in January of 1778, stumbles upon to a northern archipelago, a northern extension of the Polynesian cultural zone, what we would know as Polynesia, we would know as the Hawaiian Islands, which he named the Sandwich Islands after Lord Sandwich, who was his boss, so to speak, um, uh, the um, uh, the, ch the principal lord of the, the uh, uh, admiralty board that um, commissioned British officers and, and, and established the missions for the various voyages. And then made his way over to, uh, made landfall to the northwest coast at about 45 degrees north in the vicinity of Newport, Oregon, uh, March 1778. The first piece of land he saw uh, was kind of a flat top mountain. Um, we know it as Mary's Peak, which is the backdrop, the scenic backdrop to the pretty little college of Corvallis, Oregon. You're running into the Oregon State University. <laughs> <laughs> Go Beavs. Go Beavs. <laughs> now I'm going to digress there for a second, hoping I'm not running disastrous, disastrously behind time. I think I'm good. So I'm going to digress for a second because now we get into the great, what I, the great misunderstanding about Cook's third voyage and its consequences and his deportment, as um, the nuns in my parochial school put it on my report card. Remember <laughs> deportment? There was attendance and yeah, deportment. So Cook's deportment on the third voyage. Because the, uh, the common misunderstanding is that Cook should never have taken the third voyage because the first two exhausted him. And he wasn't, and this is again the way the story is usually told, it's not what I subscribe to, I'm just giving you the standard version. That he should have stayed retired, that he was obviously fatigued because he passed by some islands uh, down in Polynesia that in previous voyages he would have taken the time to explore. I, it was a little, he was crankier with the men. He wasn't getting along with the native people as well as he did on the earlier voyages. And to put it into our regional context, he missed places like the opening of the Columbia River and didn't pursue the Strait of Juan de Fuca. I mean, this is prima facie evidence in the standard Cook historiography about how he wasn't up to his usual stuff. The guy was worn out, fatigued. Not, not up to his, um, uh, his, his usual game. <clears throat> the reason why that is misplaced as an interpretation uh, involves a facet of this map that was established prior to the occurrence of this map, 1784 again, 
but which Cook had knowledge of before he sailed in 1776. And that is the fact that an explorer for the Hudson Bay Company by the name of Samuel Hearn in 1771 had left Churchill on the west side of Hudson Bay looking for copper that the local Indians in, their, in the routine trade, the, the, the Cree Indians would show up with chunks of copper, which of course intrigued people of, of, of European ancestry. And so Hearn went looking for, and the Indians said, well, it comes from this river that's off to the north and west. So Hearn goes on this voyage in, over the course of several years, but 1771 was the conclusive one, hundreds of miles to the west and north of Hudson Bay and reaches what he, and calculates his northernmost extent, which is to say the mouth of the Copper Mine River, thus the name, at nearly 72 degrees north latitude. Now Hearn was wrong. He actually overestimated. It was closer to 68 degrees north latitude, but still it's a long way to the north. Now the mouth of the Columbia River is about 46 degrees north latitude. The Strait of Juan de Fuca's 48 degrees north latitude. Cook's instructions, in light of Hearn's findings, which were not yet published, but which the Admiralty secured from the Hudson Bay Company, suggested to him, as an, and informed his instructions, don't even begin to look for a northwest passage until you get to 60 degrees north, because self-evidently, if a river with land, known land masses to its west, as told to Hearn by the native people of the Arctic, extended hundreds of miles west, and his, his river draining the continent went to 68 degrees. What's the point of looking for a northwest passage in this latitude if the Missouri River, a huge river, drains the opposite side of a height of land? Or this latitude? which was known on the, again, east of the mountain chain, somewhere in the middle of the continent, was to the Saskatchewan River, which would drain the low 50s, mid 50s of latitude. Why look for a Northwest Passage, which again, at this point, now I'm kind of segueing into the back half of my book, The Evolution of the Northwest Passage, because the point is there are several of them. Cook was looking for a saltwater passage from the Pacific to the Atlantic. And if there's land all the way ostensibly to 72 degrees north, why bother, why explore an opening like the Strait of Juan de Fuca or the Columbia River? It's not going to lead anywhere. It's not, it might be intriguing. And in fact, it, the, the Admiralty knew it would be intriguing. So Cook's instruction said, in effect, don't be distracted by these attractive nuisances. Stay on mission, and Cook was always very faithful to mission. And he did not actively begin to explore for a Northwest Passage until he got to 60 degrees north, for the very sensible reason that any passage through North America, if it was, if it was going to run across the top of Hearn's outfall of the Copper Mine River, had to be in the 60s or 70 degrees of north latitude. My point, ladies and gentlemen, is, is that generations of historians of the Northwest have excoriated Cook and his career have bought into the indictment that he was a failed or fatigued explorer because he did not search for a, a, an opening for the Northwest Passage at the Columbia River, the Strait of Juan de Fuca, or even all the way up to the, the Alaskan littoral, when in fact it would have been nonsensical for him to have looked for a Northwest Passage in those latitudes. But this is how legends and lore and accretions kind of get laid over a story and if I have a particular conceit to what I do with my own research and writing is to kind of unpack these legends and reintroduce contingency, which is a fancy way of saying what was the worldview of the explorer in real time rather than what we know. I mean, we know the Strait of Juan de Fuca is interesting. It provides an inlet. The Columbia River is a great river. But it was inconsequential to Cook's mission. So. wrapping up the fatigued explorer mythology of James Cook's third voyage. And of course, the cinching argument for Cook's fail, the, the Cook as a, a fatigued explorer on the third, is that he ended up getting killed 
on the third voyage in Hawaii, because after looking for a Northwest Passage, I'll talk a little bit about that here shortly, he returned to Hawaii for that winter and was killed at Kealakekua Bay, a place many of you have probably been to. And that's, all, that's the fact that he died on that voyage is just, is just posited as, again, prima facie evidence that the cook of the first or second voyage would never have put himself in a position to have been to where he found himself endangered and, and ended up losing his life. I've gone back and looked at the journals of Lewis and Clark over his first and second voyages, and actually earlier in the third, I count at least 12 instances where Cook was mighty near exactly the situation that, en that ended up leading to his death on February 14th, 1779, the original Valentine's Day massacre. That was for your benefit. Um, and, and in these stories, I mean, um, some, he dodges a spear, a stone glances off somebody else's head. My, the point is that Cook could have died. Under the circumstances, he eventually died upwards of a dozen times earlier in the course of his first, second, and third voyage. And so therefore, to extrapolate from his death, which if not exactly coincidental, was uh, uh, was not exactly surprising. In fact, after news of his death reached England, one person commented in, a, in a let, effectively a letter to the editor, it's remarkable he lived as long as he did, because he could have died any number of times. But anyway, so one last piece before we move to cap the words of Captain Cook himself. And the, again, the fatigued voyager, uh, a fatigued voyager thesis. This is an inset from this larger track map. This is Tierra del Fuego. And this is just representative. In fact, it, it is his deepest penetration to the south, almost 71 degrees south, on the way towards Antarctica. The distinguishing feature of Cook's approach on the second voyage, probing south, looking for the land, inevitably running into the Antarctic ice pack and having to return because he's in either at risk of getting snared in the ice or this crew is getting cranky and wants to go back north where it's warmer, he would make a deep run to the south and then inevitably kind of a needle nose like depiction of, of his track. Deep south, hit the ice and return. And if, if we looked at the whole map and afterwards you can take a look at the, again, the tangible example here, you can see this was, that was his pattern during what is generally considered his greatest voyage. This is from the second voyage. So quick in and out. Now, I offer that in contrast. Oh, I'm, so this is a, this, I'm, I'm kind of out of order. This is where Corvallis is right here. <laughs> this, is, this is Cook's track along the northwest coast of America. Um, the, uh, Cape Flattery is about here. He did not pursue Puget Sound for the reasons I've discussed previously. Did make a, a port call at Nootka Sound, what's, what was later perceived to be Vancouver Island. Came out to sea, again, he's, he's passing coast he otherwise would have liked those seen, but he was blown off uh, and knows that that can't lead to any productive Northwest Passage for, as a function of the Hearn thesis I provided earlier. And then makes landfall again uh, uh, up close to Sitka, Prince William Sound, Cook Inlet, out towards the Aleutians. But this is the slide I was looking for, because this is a detail of, of Cook's track after transiting the Bering Strait, which, by the way, he was the first person to map scientifically. It was presumed, in fact, that Asia and North America were not connected, but no one had documented that authoritatively until James Cook did the summer of 1778 and established the exact distance between Cape Prince of Wales here and uh, the Chuchki Peninsula over here in what's now the Russian Federation. But this, these lines and marks here is what I call your attention to because when, when Cook finally transits Bering Strait and is at last able to head in that northeasterly direction, he hits the ice pack we would think predictably, but there were again legends that maybe the Arctic Ocean was ice free during the summer months. I mean, crazy stuff like that. And that's why I consider Captain Cook to be the first polar explorer. Well, we associate him with Polynesia, but his great contribution to world geography is his work in the high southern and northern latitudes, including here. <laughs> 
But in contrast to that quick in and out needle nose uh, depiction in a search for the, uh, for the southern continent, here Cook spends a month tracking along the ice edge, the, the Arctic ice pack, being guided in the fog and the mist and the sleet and the snow by the sounds of walruses barking because they habitate on the ice edge. They'll jump into the water if a polar bear comes around, something like that, but, the, but they bark vociferously when their terrain is intruded on. So guided in the fog by the walruses, which are effectively his, his fog horns, he keeps probing the ice edge pack for a month so that he goes actually about a tenth of the way across the top of Siberia, looking for that opening that will allow him to get around the ice edge over through the top of Canada, come out of Baffin Bay, uh, get back to Great Britain, and if he had been able to successfully make that transit, win a big prize. This does not look like the pattern of exploration of a tired, worn out explorer to me. In fact, I maintain this was his most vigorous period of exploration in his entire life. And it occurred a mere six months before he died in Hawaii, the ensuing February. And this is all part of the broader thesis I lay out in my book uh, regarding uh, uh, Cook being the uh, pioneering uh, polar uh, ice scientist and uh, the more contemporary political issue of great concern to many of us today, which is the fate of the Northwest Passage, which began to transition in the wake of Cook by virtue of the exploits of the various fur traders who came to the Northwest Coast, most famously John Mears, who in 1790 published a book. Um, and I should just I, to go back and digress to say that when Cook and his men were at Nootka Sound, they acquired some sea otter pelts from the Mawachat and other natives of the, of, the, of the bay up there in anticipation of a winter in the north. They just saw these nice robes. They thought, well, this would be cool to have. And so they traded nails, beads, and whatnot to get them. Only to find out that when they get to Russia, uh, uh, Siberia, and then later at the end of the voyage when they get to China, that this sea otter robe that might have been acquired for a bead or a nail will sell for a small fortune on the Chinese fur market. It was such an enticing market, it was such an epiphany for the members of Cook's crew, of course Cook is dead by this point, that many of them wanted to return to the Northwest Coast right then to get more furs, but the, the officers uh, took command of things and the ships got back to Great Britain. Uh, in uh, the fall of 1780. But my point is it precipitated a, a, the equivalent of a gold rush, except this is a search for soft gold, furs of various animals, principally the sea otter, one of whom was John Mears. And, what, and here we get back to the story of Cook as the fatigued explorer, the incomplete explorer, because the fur traders who are at Nootka Sound and, and in these waters of our region here, spending more time than Cook had available, they're finding this coastline's kind of complicated. There are a lot of inlets and openings. And as a part of this phase, Strait of Juan de Fuca is discovered, or rediscovered, some might say. Uh, the mouth of the Columbia River is discovered. And so Cook, who had kind of written off by necessity much of this country, the coastline, turns out it's, very, it's much more complicated. It just may provide openings deeper into the continent of the kind that, go, that harkened back to those fanciful projections of the fr French and other cartographers 50 to 100 years before. So that Mears, when he publishes this chart in 1790, and you can see it here, the sea, the sea. Uh, this, this is kind of a, an intimation of what became Vancouver Island, but the premise that, that Mears and others like him popularized was, yes, there was this big landmass that we would know as Vancouver Island, but behind it was this opening sea of the type that the French and other cartographers had imagined being in place uh, half a century or more before. And um, that is how we get to um, the voyage of, of, of George Vancouver, because the fur traders raise enough questions about the complexity of the Northwest Coast to George Vancouver, 
is commissioned to come out to this part of the world, including one of his lieutenants, Peter Puget, after whom Puget's Sound is named, uh, to map this part of the world in detail for the Admiralty. Again, this is normally posited in the historiography of Cook as being necessary to do because Cook had failed to find the Northwest Passage in these latitudes in the 1770s. The point is, though, is that the, the idea of the Northwest Passage itself went through a transformation. No, no one after Hearn could possibly believe, this is Hearn's trek to the Arctic on this map shown here, no one believed that a Northwest Passage of the kind Cook was sent to look for could exist for all the reasons I described 15 or 20 minutes ago. Nothing changed in the generation after Cook. But these openings, all these inlets, reintroduced the idea that maybe that Mer de la West, that inland sea, maybe that did exist after all. And that's what people like Mears were speculating about. And that's what George Vancouver came out to map. That Northwest Passage doesn't exist either. I mean, if you think, it, uh, without getting too cute about it, George Vancouver sails into the Strait of Juan de Fuca, decides to head south our way first rather than through the Strait of Georgia up the inside passage east of Vancouver Island. He could have gone either way, but he came <laughs> south first. And so, I mean, if you think of it, George Vancouver sailing into the Strait of Juan de Fuca and I'm being, very fan, I'm being very quite operatic here with what I'm saying, so don't take me literally. So he's sailing into, but I, but I am kind of touching on the naivete of a lot of the historiography of this period. He's sailing into the Strait of Juan de Fuca, thinking he might find his way to Hudson Bay, when in fact he ends up in Tumwater. <laughs> <laughs> True story. This, Vancouver didn't come this far down. He, he was off kind of the Nisqually Reach, but Puget came down here. And over the course of several years, he defined all the, the inlets, bays, sounds of the entire coast, actually from San Diego to Cook Inlet. But the, but the Northwest Passage did not die as an idea even then, because then it went through another transformation. There's no saltwater corridor. Cook proved that didn't exist. It didn't exist then, which if there's time we can go back to. Then there was the Bay to Bay era, again, the Hudson Bay to the Mer de la West. It just simply shortens the distance between Atlantic salt water and Pacific salt water. Well, Vancouver proved that doesn't exist either. So then the idea transmuted itself into the idea of interconnecting river systems, that this would be the third version of the Northwest Passage. It was popularized by a fellow at, by the name of Alexander Mackenzie who was a fur trader for the Northwest Company, which was the Hudson Bay Company's biggest competitor. For those of you who are in the logging industry are familiar with some of its terminology, the Hudson Bay Company would be like Weyerhaeuser. The Northwest Company was a bunch of jippos. They were just kind of making things you know, on the fly, although very effective. And they are the ones that largely mapped this network of rivers and lakes that were thought, again going back to the very original idea of a Northwest Passage, a means of conveying the commerce, goods and or services and people from the Atlantic to the Pacific and vice versa. Salt water didn't exist, interlocking bays didn't exist, so maybe interlocking rivers would exist. Popularized by Alexander Mackenzie, but read avidly by one Thomas Jefferson who thought, hmm, if the British, in the case of Mackenzie, if they're really on to something here, I better get my guys out there to find that interlocking network of rivers before the British can put it into place. And that, of course, is the origin of the Lewis and Clark expedition, the third version of the Northwest Passage. Ironically, of course, a Northwest Passage is actually discovered in a sense. It's certainly put into practice. And I, in my, from my office up in Tacoma at the History Museum, I looked out on the Northwest Passage every day because there were these trains with all these container cargoes on them <laughs> running from China to Chicago in the east. Or they, some of them, they land from China here, carried across the country on effectively the Northwest Passage, Burlington Northern, Canadian Pacific, Union Pacific. That's the Northwest Passage, folks. <laughs> 
to the Atlantic and sometimes shipped directly all the way across to Europe and, and, and indeed the traffic works in the opposite direction. Isaac Stevens, our first territorial governor, therefore, is the fellow who actually maps a productive, enduring Northwest Passage. He's best known as being our first governor of conducting the contentious treaty tour, but he came west as an explorer looking for a route commissioned by the War Department to establish um, a northern transcontinental rail line that would connect the Great Lakes to the Pacific Ocean, and Isaac Stevens completed that work over the course of 1853-55. I'm going to take a deep breath there, and in the 10 minutes or so remaining, and I've gone on long, I wanted to give you some flavor of Cook himself. Because he's an interesting cultural figure in addition to one in the history of geography. And if you need to yank me, Don, don't hesitate to. But I wanted to share a few uh, thoughts of Cook's uh, in, uh, from his journals in my closing remarks here. Because there's a huge historiographic debate about Cook's role uh, in, the, um, in, the, in the history of what anthropologists and historians call the encounter, the relationship between Euro-Americans such as himself or Meriwether Lewis and the various native peoples around um, North America or indeed around the world. And um, I, I, I guess the summary observation is I, I don't think Cook, I, I think Cook's been treated somewhat unfairly in this treatment. Uh, and indeed, he was the, the, in the vanguard, and in many instances, the first European to contact many of the native peoples. Uh, but he was more sensitive to what he was about or what he had been commissioned to do than the modern critical scholars generally attribute to him. And, the, and the, there's a, a, ev ample evidence of that from Cook's journal. In describing, for example, the what we at least traditionally called the Aboriginal people of Australia. Uh, Cook said uh, the following, uh, again, being aware of the social cultural ramifications of what his ventures were a part about, aside and apart from the, the, the geography. He wrote of the Aborigines, they are far more happier than we Europeans being wholly unacquainted not only with the superfluous but the necessary conveniences so much sought after in Europe, they are happy not knowing the use of them. They live in tranquility, which is not disturbed by the inequality of condition. The earth and the sea of their own accord furnishes them with all the things necessary for life. They covet not magnificent houses, household stuff, etc. They live in a warm and fine climate and enjoy a very wholesome air so that they have very little need of clothing and they seem to, they seem to be fully sensible of this. For many to whom we gave clothing left it carelessly upon the sea beach and in the woods as a thing they had no manner of use for. In short, they seem to set no value upon anything we gave them nor would they ever part with anything of their own for any one article we could offer them. This, in my opinion, okay, this is Cook again, argues that they think themselves provided with all the necessaries of life and they have no superfluities. Now, ladies and gentlemen, that is one of the most incisive criticisms of Western materialism that has ever been written and written in the 1770s. James Cook in this regard was not merely ahead of his own time. One could argue he's ahead of our time. Unless you think that observation I just shared is an anomaly, consider this. Now talking about um, in the, uh, the part of the, the insular chain Tonga is a part of. Cook called them the Friendly Islands. It's now part of the Kingdom of Tonga. Cook had set off to survey an island. He was out with, with a handful of his guys. He was crossing the island and is on his way back to the ships when what happens next is recounted in his journal. 
We met 20 or 30 of the natives collected together and were close at our heels. We judged their design was to oppose our advancing into their country. But now they saw us returning, they suffered us to pass unmolested. Indeed, the islanders provided uh, the foreigners both food and directions back to the ship, and Cook then adds this reflection. Thus we found these people civil and good-natured, when not prompted by jealousy to a contrary conduct, a conduct one cannot blame them for when one considers the light in which they must look upon us in. It's impossible for them to know our real design. We enter their ports without daring to make opposition. We attempt to land in a peaceable manner if this exceeds all's well. If not, we land nonetheless and maintain the footing we thus got by the superiority of our firearms. In what other light can they at first look upon us as invaders of their country? The conceit of this critical postmodernist, postcolonialist scholarship that I was alluding to rather opaquely at the introduction of this section is that these scholars have discovered all of these reasons for criticizing Cook. When in fact, as demonstrated by these two examples, and I have one final one, Cook was the first and most authoritative method of impeachment of what he was about than any modern scholar who, again, in their kind of conceited sense of things, has imagined they've discovered and have posited in the literature of modern times. So one last example of Cook. Uh, he, this is now in New Zealand. And he's describing in this section the deleterious results of his crew's interaction with the Maori, the native people of New Zealand. And, and it's a bad scene. He says, such are the consequences of a commerce with Europeans, and it is more to our shame that we as civilized Christians debauch their morals, already too prone to vice, and we introduce among them wants and perhaps diseases which they never knew before, and which serves only to, to disturb that happy tranquility they and their forefathers had enjoyed. And then this is the punchline. If anyone denies the truth of this assertion, let them tell me what the natives of the whole extent of America have gained by the commerce they have had with Europeans. So the whole, the summary point of my going into this, ladies and gentlemen, is that the modern sense of the value of pluralism, the, the concept of multiculturalism, I mean, Cook, and certainly people before Cook, thought they were clearly superior to the peoples living in the disparate parts of the world. But what I just shared with you today is the first inkling in the European mind, once these words were published, you know, maybe these other civilizations have some value that we hadn't quite appreciated before. Maybe our civilization isn't the biggest and the best and superior in one way or another. And uh, in, the, in the absence of time to explicate this thought in more detail, Cook and that generation begin to crack this evidence, this edifice of European superiority. And that is the actual origin of what we consider to be kind of the basic template of civilized people in the Western world today. That, there are, that, there, that pluralism's a good thing, uh, that multiculturalism, a multicultural aspect, has things to teach us. That didn't just kind of get imposed on culture. Elements of Western civilization had to gain the original insight. And I maintain that the critical person in the evolution of that worldview, which is foundational to the way we, again, deport our behavior today, was in fact James Cook with his voyages in the Pacific Ocean in the 18th century. So with that, I will conclude. Thank you for your time and attention.